first memory. I was living in Amsterdam with my family and um, my mother would take me along the river, the Amstel, to some cafe where she would uh, have an appointment with friends to sit and uh, talk and have a nice time. I was born in 1945, so this must have been 1946. And, um, and in the cafe they had like uh, this tapestry on the tables, it like Persian, very thick uh, cloth it was. And, um, and I think and I'm pretty sure that it was the first time in my life that I ever got on my legs holding on to this tapestry which came off the table. And I remember f falling on my bump and my mother really being disturbed by it because uh, probably came cups and, and things with it. And um, being angry, which of course isn't very nice when you consider it's the first time you get on your legs. So, I mean, standing on your own legs is some major event in, in, in life. So maybe it has some influence on the, the rest of my life story. <laughs> <laughs> who, who were your mother and father? Well, um, yeah, um, my mother, I can start with her was a very beautiful, uh, very um, articulate speaking uh, lady. She got married with my father before the war and um, probably because he was so such a very, very intelligent man, very intelligent, very well educated. She had um, a lot of artistic things inside her, but she never really got it out in a way that she had her own thing going. She was forever, I see her sitting in this chair, and um, which I inherited from the house where we used to live, and uh, she was always reading. Any time of the day she wasn't doing something for kids, household, going to theater, because that was one of her main things, she was sitting in this chair and read and read and read. I wrote once, lekker naar bed met een boekje van Colette. I my mother goes nicely to bed with a little book from, written by Colette. So for me, her reading is something, well, I took it with me and my whole family. We are books. I, for myself, I very often say I'm, I'm you know, a, a book folded open at some page and there a story comes out. Books is the thing of the family. My father was a university teacher, a professor. His whole room was covered with books, and there were all these Middle Evil books. I'm sure he had a great order in his, in his library. And he was a man, he was a wild man. He would, in the night, he would be making these wild animal sounds just to express his frustration, maybe, or something like that. And in daytime, there was this gentleman, and this thing, when we were living in Amsterdam and I was born, after I was born, I, he still would do that. Early in the morning, out of the bedroom would come this, like a lion in a cage or a tiger in a cage. He would hear this roaring sound and I would be really scared. And then half an hour later, this gentleman would, with his, with his, with his, you know, his necktie and his, uh, his hair wet from being uh, washed and would enter the kitchen to have breakfast. And nobody would talk about this, but for me, I mean, I loved him, but he scared the shit out of me at the same time. I mean, he was a heavy-duty guy, you know. One day my mother asked my sister and me to come in the living room. It was a very sunny day, just three days before my 13th birthday. And she said, uh, uh, sit down, and I was expecting something very nice to hear because in a few weeks it would be summer holiday and we would go to Switzerland and I had my birthday in three days from that day and so I expected some really nice news and she said father and I are getting divorced. At that point I think something or I know it was like you know the thunder and and lightning entered my life. I mean I it was like that. And um, 
I know I burst into tears uh, and said, but and came with all these little fragments of, but isn't he coming to my birthday then? And how about the holiday and this and this and that? But I felt at the same time this totally black feeling inside me. I mean, such a thing that I can't even find words for it. And then my mother said, well, go to his study and tell him what you tell me. So I made this long walk over the corridor and the red light wasn't on and I went into his study and there he was and I wanted to tell him all these things but he took immediately he took over and he said well it will be all for the best of all of us and you will see it will be okay and so I just kept inside me what was burning to get out and that really set a pace for many stories. A little while later my father had a few very good friends one of them was a um, a, a, a painter and I used to go to his house which is in a very nice location outside Amsterdam but sadly this uncle which I considered an uncle he wasn't a, a blood uncle but as being the best friend of my father would tell me very nice things but at the same time he would we would do the dishes after dinner if I stayed there for dinner and he would be touching me and, you know, my breast or, or look in my eyes and ask if I love him. Or he would say, let's make a nice little ride to the country. And I wouldn't dare to say no. And so, and his wife, I don't know whether she realized what was happening, but I was trying to keep it away from her because I felt terribly embarrassed. And I, and if I had to say, do you love me? I, I was, I was saying inside, I was saying no, but maybe in the outside I said mm, yes. Or, I mean, it was extremely uncomfortable. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't talk to anybody about it. I went to the gymnasium, which is like a school with Latin and Greek and uh, history, and uh, you know, and I was quite a good student. So, and I devoted a lot of time to my homework. It gave me really, it gave me really a safe spot to be, and to be with boys. Um, I always wanted to be friends. I wanted to be uh, a guy among the guys. We would uh, have this very great, I mean we had a lovely group of friends, but the minute they came too close to me and they, I remember a boy saying, well you have very nice legs and I would say, well they're just boys legs. I didn't want to know, I didn't want to hear that my legs were girls legs or nice legs and, and um, yeah I would kiss or something like that, but um, when I felt a boy too close to me, I would become very uncomfortable without realizing that it might have stemmed from this thing with that uncle. I think it it's, has remained an obstacle, you know, and um, uh, choosing Lovers, friends, husbands. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. To really show the the innermost being, where it's connected to sexuality, has been dangerous. And um, yeah. Um, I was working in a cafe, and uh, in a very popular cafe in Amsterdam, a brown cafe they were called, uh, dark, uh, made very dark, and a lot of people would come in and uh, I would be serving beer and food and things. And then one day some guy came in, and when he came in I was just absolutely flabbergasted. I mean, this was Amor shooting a, an arrow straight in my heart. I mean, I. So many people came in and there, there was this one guy and wow, gone I was. I had to turn around and fumble with the beer before I could, you know, my heart was going like crazy before I could turn around again and be this bar lady who would be cool and serve a glass of beer. This guy would speak, was speaking English and he was with a very nice looking lady. So I was cool and I was serving her beer. And after a little while he left with the lady and that was the end of it as far as I was concerned. But, to my surprise, about an hour later, back was this man on his own without this lady. 
ordering again another glass of beer and asking me if I didn't know a nice apartment in Amsterdam because he had he was working in Amsterdam he was come he came from London or he was an American living in London and he worked for some arts uh, for some um, advertisement agency and uh, he needed a nice house a good house so we got, of course, in a nice conversation. We had dinner together, and while we had dinner together, it was a beautiful day in August on the Amstel. He again the Amstel. He would say, uh, he said, uh, "Hey, it's very strange. With it's like something is sticking in my throat." Anyway, we stayed together. We found ourselves a very nice place outside Amsterdam, and we were. I was madly in love with him, and. He was in love with me and we had a grand time and I was so fucking happy, I couldn't believe it, that I could be that happy. And then he, um, but this thing like something is sticking in his throat was uh, becoming worse and worse and um, it got so bad that one day he went to England where he was still connected to national health and he had a looked over and he had cancer in the esophagus. He was 34, I was 26. I went after him to England, he had an operation, there was nothing to be done about. And we went together, uh, we rented with the help of some friends a very, very beautiful um, cottage in Hampshire. And that's where he died one day, I was one night, I was there, it has been one of the, yeah, you can imagine, um, it has changed my whole life. When it was his time to go, we had asked the doctor there to help him to, uh, uh, he was afraid of suffocating, and I called that doctor, it was the evening, and I got his wife on the phone and she said, I'll give my husband, uh, I'll connect you to my husband, and nobody came on the phone, so, um, and the phone was, remained connected to their house so I couldn't use the phone to call anybody else so I went back to my friend who was on the couch and really disappearing um, well it was my first uh, uh, ever being with someone dying so whatever was happening was new and very uh, yeah yeah special you know I had no time to think about things because he was being very ill and dying and I would just, he couldn't talk and I would just, like he was a baby, you know, I would get up and get the things without him asking me anything, at least not in words and everything just happens like... <sighs> so what happened to me that night is, if I can put it in a few words, I somehow went with him. I went to the other side. I went, I was, I was with him. Uh, he was leaving and I tell you what happened to me is there was this ocean of light he was disappearing in it and I was standing on the edge and some voice said to me you have to go back this ocean was white light like silver or gold and there was this line like a mess like a knife and I walked on that line and I came back in the room and there I was with him it was very early morning in May, the, 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 it was just a, in the daylight would just come in the room and that ended with his, him dying and me somehow going over the border of the here and whatever is there. My mother was a, an atheist and really, I mean, if there was any politics in our house that had to do with <laughs> religion is absolute nonsense and anything connected to religion is nonsense. Life would end uh, at the moment of death and, uh, and uh, anything that is more than that is nonsense. After Ted died, I wanted to go to America. Ted came to, from America and I had always yeah, been attracted to America. And um, I promised him I would go back to Holland for a year at least, and then go to America, if I still wanted to go to America. I went back to Holland, and uh, after that year, I still wanted to go to America. And one day, who came to my place, 
you who are here behind this camera and said tomorrow I'm going to America and I said okay tomorrow I'm also going to America and off we went together to America. <laughs> For me it was really going on my own more than going with you but I made that step um, and at the end of that trip to America was Bob and Bob I had already met. Bob in fact who later became the father of my children, was the first person I talked about my whole thing that happened with um, the dead of Ted. And, uh, but then I went to Holland and he was in England and, uh, and then a long time later in America, there was Bob in California, I came to California, Bob was there to witness the birth of his first grandchild and his wife Kelly, his beautiful wife Kelly, had just died. I came after a long trip all over the, Ameri over the States and had a telephone number of Bobson and I called and went over to their house and there was Bob and there I was as well witness of the birth of uh, Bob's grandchild. And then Bob and I got connected of course and um, I got pregnant and there was my first daughter born, Aziza, in California, and um, I was mother, I became mother. Well, I was living in America, and I was this Dutch girl, and being pregnant and becoming a mother certainly has changed considerably my relationship with Bob, who was a wild man, a man really influenced by the 60s. We, we were traveling all over, we would sleep one night, we would sleep here, we would smoke dope, we would get drunk, we would do this, we would do that, and suddenly I was pregnant and here I was and I just couldn't do no things anymore. And there was Bob and doing, continuing doing it. So there was definitely something between us growing which um, made me more uh, the, the <laughs> well, uh, we call it burgerlijk, you know, the, the values of uh, a pregnant woman. I, I certainly didn't smoke uh, that much anymore, and I certainly didn't want to get drunk anymore that much anymore, and uh, I wanted, had to go to bed, and I had to eat properly, and yeah, it's, uh, for Bob it wasn't easy, and for me it wasn't easy. So, Aziza was born in Santa Rosa, in California, and um, <laughs> Bob, uh, I, I love to have people present, I don't know why, I, when, when, when things are, with my birth, I have, I have given birth three times and there have always been people around in the room, it's like some royal birth, it felt a bit like, uh, <laughs> I was very good at it too, and uh, <laughs> I had a, what, as you may say, a natural childbirth. I wrote to my mother, of course, when I was in America, that I was pregnant, and my mother wrote back and, and, and she said, oh, it's terrible when you're pregnant, it's so bad, uh, you, but take care that you are with a good doctor, and it's awful to have babies, and, and, um, and my sister, I never have had a good relationship to my sister, but she even wrote me a letter to tell how terrible it is to have babies, and go to a hospital, and and be sure that there is doctors around. She had a cesarean, I think, once or two times. And, and uh, so I decided uh, just to do not what my mother told me and what my sister told me, but to go to, for a real natural childbirth. And, um, and I had a wonderful midwife and uh, I had gave birth at home and nothing happened that would have sent me to the hospital. In fact, Bob was too drunk because uh, it took, of course, many hours before I, my daughter came and he would, uh, um, his friend uh, Tim was feeding him. I think they were, they were um, uh, Bloody Marys. So by the time that Aziza was born at six o'clock in the morning, she was born on a wonderful um, April day. He was absolutely drunk and he was roaring and he was hilarious. He was, he was out of, his mo out of his mind, and this was, of course, I was more into being quiet and have candlelights and mm, subdue and things, but there was this father like, wow! <laughs> and I think it 
it's okay. When I look back at the values, maybe that I don't know. I was too happy that the baby was born anyway because uh, it's heavy business to get a baby, and certainly it was that first one. And um, yeah, and then we were living in California, and after California, we went to for a little while. We went to Europe. I showed my baby to the family. Then we went to Kenya, where Bob went to uh, to to make some movie. And well, I won't get into everything that happened, but I was still breastfeeding Aziza, and um, of course, and I was living in Kenya. I was waiting for Bob. We made a trip on the ocean in a sailing boat, and I was staying with friends in Kenya. And um, this was this neo hippie colonial. Uh, Nairobi life we were having there and, um, and Aziza was a year old and I was still breastfeeding her and in this hippie uh, neo-colonial uh, Nairobi uh, life giving tits to a one-year-old wasn't really the thing uh, although I really wanted to do it but Aziza was getting ready to get off the tit and for a few days I went on safari. We met the Maasai there and um, they were the most beautiful people I've ever seen in my whole life. These bodies of these boys, I mean, it was absolutely magnificent. And then after that little trip that's on in, in this, this safari trip, maybe it lasted a week or something, I came back to Nairobi. And by that time, and we moved to Mombasa somewhere, and then by that time Bob came after his trip over the ocean. And the first night that Bob was back, I got pregnant from Jason, my son. And I think, I think Jason is a Messiah. He looks like it, and uh, he's white, but he, is, he has a Messiah inside him. And that's my son, who was born nine months later in Wales. So. And mother in Wales, when I had two children and life was still pretty wild with Bob, um, I was longing for Holland. And it took me, my life took me back to Holland with two children. And I invited Bob to come to Holland as well, which he did. But if he would not have come, it would have, I still would have gone to Holland because our lifestyles, our lifestyle and Rear, how do you call that? Two children and the way I felt the responsibility of bringing them up was in a very difficult balance for me. So I wanted to go back to home, back home after many years away from Holland, and that's what I did. We had this nice lunch on the beach just now, and uh, of course. Our thoughts were running on without running the camera and uh, one of the things we were talking about was about shame and I told you in Dutch um, the sexual parts, body parts are called shame parts. I don't know if there's an English an equivalent which points in that same direction. The Vaginal lips are called shame lips in Dutch. And for some reason, recently I was thinking about it because the emotion shame is something we all know. And then I was wondering whether this sexual parts, the lower parts of the body, whether that was somehow, uh, I mean, one can have an incredible amount of joy coming from it, but so often there is, it's connected with shame. And uh, I can't. I haven't worked out, and I don't think I'll be able to work out <laughs> where that comes from. But um, I know for myself that I, t I told something about this uncle who, uh, who who put his hand on my breast when I was 13 or 14. They were hardly there, but he did it anyway. And a little uh, another time he wanted to undress me and I said no and that's when I ran out of the house but I was ashamed to talk about it I didn't tell his wife I didn't tell my mother I didn't tell anybody in fact in that same year I was in the Lolita age there was this uh, guy on the beach 
who was approaching me and said, so oh, Trotsky, ich hab von dir geträumt. Um, and he was like the father of two boys I was playing with. And again, I was ashamed. I didn't know what to do with it. I wasn't... Um, maybe the body was, you know, showing something, but my inside, this girl, 13, 12, 13, 14 years, wasn't there at all. And this being ashamed and hiding, uh, it has to do with taboo, you're not supposed to talk about, um, makes, I think, this whole sexual thing very um, dark, dark cornered area. And for myself, I haven't come out of that shame until I came with a partner, and that's my husband, um, with whom I really told what I want sexually, what I like, what I love, what I need. And until not so long ago, we are together about eight, nine years now, and he is not the father of my children, um, I was always keeping something of myself in the dark which wasn't working out very well in my relationship with my husband at all, the father of my children. And, um, yeah, I think as a child I took it on me, upon me, to feel guilty uh, that a grown-up had approached me and, and I had put it down way in my subconscious. And it, the following rather difficult relationship with, uh, or sexual relationship with my real partners, not with a, with a one night stand, then I could just, wah, you know, I could live it out. But when I had a real relationship with someone and it became uh, not just an infatua infatuation, but a partnership, then all this, yeah, unworked out shit would come up and I haven't, been able to clean myself and bring it out openly, I hadn't the courage, I was still ashamed, I guess, to, uh, to be a free person in it. And, um, well, I think that's anything that's... <laughs> I, know, I know one of the things I know is Rudolf Steiner, and I'm definitely not an anthroposophical person, but I read once something he said that everything that's in the dark aims to get to the light, wants to go to the light, wants to grow to the light. And I think he somehow, in order, you can translate it in many different uh, metaphors, but I think it's true. And uh, I have become happy to bring things out in the light, you know. It's, it's something that I evoke somehow. I, I live now here in this house, which is my old house for many, many years already. My kids grew up here since we were in Holland. And uh, I'm married, uh, I went through a lot of problems with my husband, we are absolute opposites from each other, but our sexual relationship was right from the beginning, dead on, because I had promised myself to get a good sexual relationship, because I knew from these rare occasions that I was capable of having a very good sex experience with myself and with my partner. And, um, and I I was ready to give that to myself, but it wasn't the only thing, a relationship doesn't just exist of having a good sexual relation, so, so, so many other things came about, which fucked up again my relationship with my husband. And I start to think for myself, well, my parents couldn't do it, so that's why I can't do it, and I want to have an experience in my life in in be with a partner where it is okay. So what am I missing? I don't know. I'm in the middle of a relationship. He is living in another house and I'm living here and we're working out now this kind of thing. I'm a few days here, him there and I like that. For him it was difficult. He wanted a household with his wife and his house. He's much more uh, old-fashioned in that sense. He's very, very together, grounded, which gives me a good feeling. But once his, he, he, he gets demands to me, 
that I have to be there and I have to do this or I have to, uh, then my freedom is gone and I start to revolt and then I get wild and I have to do other things. And uh, this wildness is part of me and if he doesn't accept my wildness, well, you know, then we can't stay together. And for a while I have tried to tame my own wildness. But it pops out anyway. I mean, it can't do anything else because I am not such a quiet, uh, subdued uh, little girl, even though I can play it. But this playing thing is, yeah, it's okay to play for a while, but it's not the end of my personality. So I have three children and they're all three totally different. And, uh, and in all three, I see things from myself, I recognize things from myself, and I recognize things from their father, but they definitely have their own thing going. And they're half American, half Dutch. And um, they had to go in their life through a lot of human difficulties. Their parents got divorced. And uh, so I did what I had experienced in my life as a child and they were still like my the youngest one was like 11 I think and then my son was 13 and my daughter 14 and my older daughter was 16 so they went through that and then a few a few years later their father died but I remain I always remained in contact with their father he was an artist and he was living in his studio in the back of my house our house and for me, there was this real wish that my children would have a chance to be with both parents. What happened in my time, that my parents, who were married for like 24 years, and preparing their 25th anniversary, would have split up and didn't talk to each other anymore, except through a lawyer. Um, my oldest daughter has a very, very, very nice friend, and I learn, I learn and I learn a lot from their relationship. It's playful, it's giving each other space, it's, it's, it's wonderful. The playfulness is certainly in me. I have tried so many times and thought to, with my husband, why don't you laugh? I'm very funny. And then he did, he was just, you know, being so basic and so grounded and so, and I thought, God, this is what I'm doing now. It's funny. He's not laughing. And it made me, it made me sad, you know, and it made me turn off from him. And then I think, Who's this guy? My God, he's not such a nice guy. Maybe in bed it's nice, but he, uh, a little bit more sense of humor would be okay. And uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He wasn't feeling quite nice. And that built up to a point that I said, I, 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 this relationship isn't nice. I don't want to stay in it. And uh, I split up. And, uh, well, Everybody knew they were splitting up, here they are splitting up, and a few weeks later something happened and some new space was opened and we're together again and my children are scratching on their heads and think, Mama, are you happy or are you unhappy? And Mama is doing...